in the spotlight, featuring people from all walks of life, spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, and aspirations, untold songs, touching the human and personal side of the four people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media. the time in the studios of Q95. Stand by. We're beginning shortly with tonight's In the Spotlight radio show. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Pleasant good evening to you. Here we are tonight after a two-week break. Last week Monday I was actually out of state and the Monday before that was it a holiday? Oh, I just don't remember, but we had a wonderful repeat all the same. So repeat, we repeated Ibrahim Brohim, and last week I think it was Lloyd Charles, our visually impaired young man who has gone off to college and graduated successfully. Congratulations to, to you, Lloyd. I hope at some point we can probably do a nice short interview and get an update on how you've done and how things are with you. But good evening and welcome to tonight's In the Spotlight radio show. Welcome listeners, welcome viewers. And let me just continue to say um, how much, you know, we continue to appreciate all of your support. Uh, we want to remind you to follow our In the Spotlight radio show page. We also invite you to become a fan of our group by the In The Spotlight Radio Show page. Go to our YouTube channel, Fedina F. Frampton, and subscribe. If you want to give us some kind of support, we have Cash App, uh, Dollar Sign Spotlighters, and we also have more banking. You can also contact me on 275-7565 to see how you can make a contribution to our efforts here with the In The Spotlight Radio Show. So welcome everyone saying thank you and acknowledging Q95 FM Radio. We're always happy uh, that you provided us this platform to be able to connect with our friends, our fans, and our uh, listeners and viewers as well. And we want to thank Josephine Gabriel and Company Limited. They are the agents for Barefoot Wine and they also provided our water for tonight. Top it or water on the In the Spotlight radio show. We want to thank Dominica News Online for always supporting us. Aki Lo, uh, Aki, where are you? Aki has been a big MIA for a couple of weeks. I hope that Aki is going to resurface at some point because we've not been able to do our flyers. So we're saying good evening to you, Aki, wherever you are. John and Jerome GK, thank you, GK, for your support, not only with the In the Spotlight radio show, but you know, our TV series, um, we're, we're getting ready to bring them to you and we're coming soon, don't worry. The friends and supporters of the show, we say thank you to you for your support now and always on the In The Spotlight radio show. We're, our time has changed, we are now at 8.30, so I do not want to waste um, 
much time getting the program going. But before I do that, uh, just this evening, we launched our, we launched a video um, promoting uh, a, a scholarship that a US $500 scholarship and saying so from the beginning, it is a wonder for the 2022-2023 um, school year. It is for students who have sat the national assessment exams, uh, students, uh, or, or, or the, the, the criteria. It, it indicates that you need to have sat the national assessment exams this year. Um, of course, you've never entered um, secondary school. Uh, you would need to be um, in a single parent household or probably living with a grandparent or grandparents. Um, it also requires that you uh, that the student actually um, needs the assistance. And so, you know, we really want our um, the most deserving student to get this scholarship. So this was actually an idea of one of the fans of the show. She she chooses to remain anonymous, um, but we will really, really, really want to thank her um, for that scholarship. So if you go on my page or in the Spotlight Radio Show page, you will see the video and you will see the email address. By the way, I've already gotten one application. We put this on at about after 7 this evening, around 7, 7.30 and we are already receiving applications. So again, it is a one-stop scholarship for this year, but we have in discussions to go even bigger next year, God willing, and it is a US $500 scholarship. And if you go check out the video, you will see all the other information um, that you need. So this is just something new that we're doing, and it was the idea initiative of a fan of the show. It was not my idea, I'm not going to take it, but I was happy to use this platform to assist this person who really has a good heart. And although she chooses to remain anonymous, um, she did share with me some, just a little write-up that I can share with you. And it reads, most of us are probably familiar with the Mighty Sparrow's popular song, Education is a Must. As a child, every time I heard that song, I was totally convinced that education was indeed the foundation. But as I entered adulthood, I realized that access to education sometimes boils down to the haves and the have-nots. Unfortunately, some children's educational success can hinge on meeting their financial needs. These students might not be able to fully participate in the learning process. Thus, Sparrow's theory that knowledge is the key to success is the primary reason I am providing this financial scholarship. I also truly believe that to him much is given, much is required. During my academic career, I was able to obtain a BA, a bachelor's, and a master's degree without having to pay contribute, to contribute financially. So today, I am merely paying it forward. To the recipient of this scholarship, I wish you much success as you embark on your academic journey. And that she signs as in the Spotlight Radio Show supporter. So I really want to thank you. In about two weeks, we will make a decision. And then in about a few days after that, we will um, uh, present to the lucky recipient US $500 that can go towards uh, purchasing books, uh, stationery, uniforms, shoes, whatever the case might be. And this is just the beginning of more things to come from this particular um, supporter of the show and we're hoping that if others if you are listening and you really want to join in that's quite fine we can just it just means that we'll be able to give more than just one scholarship to um, to the, those who apply so we can probably do more than one and give support whether it be stationery or books or, or, or shoes or uniforms to maybe one or two other students so feel free to make contact with me and uh, support if you wish to. All right, so 846 is the time in the studios here of Q95, and we're going to get going with our guest tonight on the program. Again, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much. Thank you for joining us tonight. You may find my voice sounds a little funny. I'm a bit nasal. I do not have COVID. <laughs> I just have, you know, a little flu that seems to be going around and it seems to be a little tough one. It can get you a bit stuffy. 
and, and so on. So we're getting ready to go in the spotlight radio show for tonight. My guest is a gentleman who goes by the name of Jeff Bellot. Many of you may recognize his voice from um, calling uh, this radio station and I will presume other radio stations as well. And, but he, from what I'm understanding, has quite a story. And I thank you for choosing us tonight. Thank you for joining us on the program. As we get straight into it, and say good evening to Mr. Jeff Bella. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening to Diana. Good evening to all the listeners. Um, thanks for having me as a guest on your show tonight. It is my absolute pleasure, and it just so happens that Mr. Bellot is here and living soon. <laughs> Mr. Bellot called me about something, uh, he sent me a voice note about something totally different. And voila, I hold on the gentleman, uh, inviting me to in the spotlight. <laughs> and there he is tonight, and I truly appreciate that he is here uh, to share his story. Um, with us, an interesting one, as I said, as I have been told. So, Mr. Bellot, an opportunity to say good evening to everyone. Good evening again, and um, it's good to be here on your program. I um, really want to say special good evening to the folks in the Sufis Concept Plan of Punishment area. A lot of people follow your voice in the agenda, and to all those who are listening um, wherever they are. And I hope that um, by the end of the show, I'll be able to motivate some of the listeners. Um, to make them realize that if you have a dream, it can come true. You gotta believe and you gotta put the work into it. And um, interestingly, as much as you are here to share your story, um, you really made it clear to me that there's a few things that you would like to focus on um, this evening at one point during the course of the program. And I, I found that um, quite interesting that the guest says to me, listen, I do not mind sharing my story, that's no problem, I can do that. But I want to focus on the young people. I want to motivate them, I want to inspire them, I want to share my story with them, that they may be motivated and to act themselves. And another key area you said that you want to speak to tonight is about agriculture. So, um, but we'll find out, there's so much more <laughs> to you than those um, areas that you mentioned. So, um, so Mr. Bell, let us begin. You, you, I see you. You started by um, ailing up the folks from the Sufria Scotland area, and I would presume that this is where you hail from. Yeah, I, I'm actually from Scotland, and I was telling people the story that I was not imported from Princess Margaret Hospital. I was actually born at my mother's house on a beautiful Friday afternoon in October, and um, you know, my uh, what they used to call midwife. So I always tell my friends, hey, you know, I was born here. I was not important for the hospital. So it's something that I always take credit for. <laughs> um, you know, grew up in Scotland, um, you know, very little to survive as a young person. Um, lived with my mom, my grandma, and my brother, my sister, and uh, to the uncle of ours. So we had a very tiny house, um, about two bedrooms to begin with, a wooden house. And um, I remember the days when it rained. I used to get wet. And, um, the days too that it was very difficult and um, it, 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 it's the interesting side of the story is that being a single parent and my mom you know like did everything possible for us and whereas for those who know me my father's side of the family um, you know they, they did well you know, um, you know they're pretty wealthy but I was stuck with my mom and um, you know I, I really want parents to understand what to say because I wasn't really considered a bell or my dad really to fall until I was almost 18. Mm -hmm. So I knew what my dad was and I give my mom a lot of credit for doing all this work. And that's why I really want to talk about the youth and especially young men um, out there to realize that you have a responsibility um, as, as a young man. Um, you know, it's not only going and sleep with someone, but when the child comes, you be responsible. And, um, I ended up in a relationship with my dad, and um, you know my mom took care of us. We, we had it very difficult, but at the end of it, um, she taught us one good thing. My brother and I is that we need to respect women, we need to respect ladies in general, whether they're older or younger than us, because the burden a woman carries as a single parent is not something easy. And she took us to church and she preached that in our head all the time. So I'm very thankful for my mom. I don't think it wasn't for my mom. I'm 
good moral health and able to really um, motivate people about the importance of um, being responsible. And if every young man is listening today, or I will really strongly encourage them to think twice before action sleep. And um, when we look at when I look at my life and look at where I am today, um, some people never thought of me there. But it, it's, it's, it's a relationship. And credit to my dad who came forward and then um, you know everyone was a girl. And then joined the family and all of that, including um this is my so rest in peace, Harry Bella, the actual first cousin. And the first time we met at the CC Dallas estate in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, and we had a great discussion. And, and you know, the family came together. And I'm sharing this story because a lot of people look at me and don't realize the struggles I went through in life mm -hmm. and the motivation behind it. And as young persons, you know, we like to go out and have a good time. But at the same time, we have to realize that we have to be held accountable for actions. And every young parent right now, what I want to say to them is this, no matter what the challenges or difficulty you may be going through, if you believe doing things for the right reason, your children are going to succeed and you will be successful and the rewards will really work. Mm -hmm. So are you saying here that um, when you said you, you, you met your father or you got to know your father at age 18, uh, is it a situation that he opted not to accept you as his child earlier on? Well, I knew what my dad was. You knew who he was? Yes, but because of the situation that happened, which uh, I'm actually writing a book about that. Okay. Um, why it's important for parents to be open um, with the children. And when my mom said the story, and my dad gave me the same side of the story, it was, it's pretty much, you know, hammer to nail. <laughs> so, I, was, I, I talk about this is very difficult, but I want people to realize that, um, you know, most of my life, I grew up as a very long name, Stephen St. Augustine. Um, there's a teacher in Sufri, Miss Angor, um, who always still call me Augustine. And um, I remember the day that I got registered as a Bella. I this um, lady passed away, and she said to me, you know, your name is Jeff Bella now. Could you write that? I said, I could spell that with my toes. It's so much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, like, I, I grew up like this, and common interest came. And I had two certificates registered. Um, still in Silicon Valley, in Germany. So I can't remember exactly how this thing went up. There was this whole dispute about whether did he passed the exam. Is that him or is not that him? Oh my goodness. So it was interesting. And then um, I continued doing what I'm doing. And I'm like, I remember um, during the commentary exam too. I really didn't pass as I wanted to. Whatever mm -hmm. it was, the Augustine or the Bella name, mm -hmm. that was the dispute. But a, a few great things happened. And one of them was that, um, you know, like most of the journalists, he was a, a, a brother at the uh, St. Mary's Academy, and everybody knew him as Brother Will. And I had a very good friend, a family, I won't mention her name, she is a very close um, friend with a, a former principal. I think she must still be the principal of a particular um, um, high school in Dominica. And these two people could not get um, those, the person that I would call, or the house call, it, community high school and, and St. Mary's Academy to convince them to get middle school. And I remember when the journalist came home and said to my mother, um, in Creole, and said to my mother, Well, me that see Jeff Nipoli High School, we can, but Papa Bode just have Kesha and you prefer to Jeff Nipoli. And I look at this guy, and you know, we, we dealt with it. Then I went to the, um, you know, I went to the youth center, and I came across a young lady by the name of Valencia Webb. So you morning. didn't go to secondary school? I did not go. I, the, well, the, the interesting thing for them was that. There were people that passed the exam higher than. Well, if you remember the story, my mom is very poor. Yes. And we went to some of those schools, and some of these kids, I passed a little higher than. Get to go to high school, but I did not. So I'm saying this because a lot of time, and just so you heard Pastor Jack and Lugan talking about the Bible and the Word of God, we sometimes have to be patient. God always has a plan for every one of us. And maybe I was just a sacrifice or an example. Maybe a two step, never for to be here and giving the story today. But the reality is that we have to learn to be humble. I went to the youth center and I met Miss Webb, Valencia Webb. She's still alive right now. 
And she looked at me and she said, you know, why are you not in high school? And I told her the story. She looked at me and I remember these words to me. She said to me, Jeff, you're going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her, I'm like, what do you mean? She said, Jeff, you're going to be someone great one of these days. I st I'm still the one to get a chance. And Valencia Web changed my life. Valencia Web. Miss Web from the youth center. And I remember the, um, the two sisters with, um, from um, from Mitchell too, um, um, hopefully Mary and her sister passed away. They had a program at the youth center one time and they wanted someone to pray and they volunteered to pray. Because the other side of the story, I always wanted to be a priest, right? <laughs> so I prayed and then um, they came to me and they asked me, you know, where are you from? What, you know, what, why are you not in high school? And uh, we, we spoke for a while and they were like, they're going to be something great. So a few people said yeah. that to you. Yeah. But, but just help us understand, was it the, the, the confusion between your name first, why you didn't get into high school? Not really, because at the end of it, they figured it out, which one was correct. Right. But I really did not do very well in the exam as I wanted to. Right. But the unfortunate thing was that what really hurt, and this is... Really but did you pass? Well, those days, they, they have those passes. I don't think I passed. They have this thing called a half pass, whatever. Okay. So I did not pass the exam. You I didn't really pass did. the exam? No, I did not. Okay. But there's a list of the what they call it supplementary list. list correct and then I was on the top and there were people below me like five six seven ah, below me no I didn't get to go to high school no, and I didn't no I'm getting you yeah. so you're saying you didn't pass the common entrance exams which is what it was called then it's now national assessment no. however I remember there's normally a supplementary list you're saying you were on top the first one of the supplementary list right, right? and there were other people behind you on the supplementary yeah. list for whatever reason, nobody wanted to take you in the high school, but others who were below you yep. got in. Yeah, and I remember oh, too. And, and when we look at, yeah, when we look at um, favors and, and you know the, the world in Dominican and corruption, these things have been going around a long time. First, it is because my mom really like this poor lady. Nobody mm -hmm. would know she. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew. I mean, I, I was in Jeff Bella. Mm -hmm. you know, just like people like Harry Bella, people on the stream from her. Right. <laughs> so. We went there and then nobody knew who we are. And um, but we just said, but when Usina joined us, he wasn't even a priest yet. And um, he said that. I don't know if that came from him or from God, but you know, I went to the youth center and Valencia Web. He's still a real hero. She's a hero to me. And um, we did all that. And um, I just, we just take it as that. And then went to the center. I was like, I'm not even interested in GSP exam. Right. I, didn't, I didn't sit because I was so upset. And then um, I went there. A very good friend of mine um, is in Atlanta now, Sean Francis. And I used to joke about it going to the youth center to get a ride from his dad. And I said, Sean, I'm not going to do that exam because they might do the same thing to me. Mm -hmm. And I studied the youth center. You were already demotivated from very that. Very demotivated from yeah. that. And then my mom said to me, You know, you have to realize that. You know, patience is everything. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 you have to realize that. We pray a lot every, every day walking from that road. Scott said to suffer it was 7 o'clock mass in the morning, very early. And there was not a choice. I had to wake up <laughs> to go to church. And then from there, the youth center did the skills training program. Um, helped myself. I did a lot of the training program, the skills training program. I think if you go to the youth center today in Rose on High Street, mm -hmm. some of the work we did is still there. Like we built these walls. Um, you know, some of the painting, like the other area where they have the dorms and stuff, we built that. And like there's a little area where they cook, we did that. And you know, people like John Roach, uh, Mr. Pina, and um, a couple of Pina, these guys, um, you know, Elizabeth and Fred, these were great people I was surrounded with. And um, they really helped me along the way, realizing that, you know, nothing is impossible if you stop the mind to it. And from there, my first job actually after that was Sylvester Texan. Guys like Bolo who said the boom job, we work together on this. Um, and then from there, I end up at Asta as a spray person. And as a what? As a spray man. You know, a lot of people didn't know this. In Dominica, we, mm -hmm. in the 90s, we used to make foam right here in Dominica. I was one of the chemical person mix. I was used to science, I love science. So I was very interested in mixing the chemicals to make the foam at the foam factory in Asta at Astavans. And then I would spray the furniture after that. So. I went all around this place trying to find who I am, what I want to do, and I did all that stuff, and um, 
you know, then election came and Mr. Manat came to me and said, you know, your wife and we wanted to come in from you. I'm like, what are you talking about? As a, as a youth? As a you young, a young man, person. A young person because when Mr. Manat, um, I was company, his company manager in 1995. But what happened is that um, I run for the Super Scots and Gallery Village Council. I was one of the youngest person that run the election, actually won in Sufre and Scott said. And um, I remember the campaign, uh, some of the stuff I said, well, we must call it horse rate and da da da. And people saw me, they had the potential, and they voted me. <laughs> and then I was like, ooh. <laughs> and then um, I was part of the council for a while, with people like your dad. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, I was one of the youngest person. And I remember people like Gustav Williams, who called me young chap, are you learning anything? <laughs> Good evening, Gustav Williams. <laughs> I'll show you remember those days. And then from the village council, like, well, my dad ended up passing away. Mm -hmm. And then they came to me and said, hey, you know, your dad used to organize last week at St. Peter's Concert Feast. And I was like, oh, this young guy, I don't know what I'm doing. And I took the man to organize the first um, St. Peter's where we also had a block corona for the first time. And it was so good. And every year people depended on me to organize it. Then the Scotland Improvement Committee was formed. And then around the same time, Corley Corner is going, and then Mrs. Davis, she, she was scared. She's like, Jeffrey, need you, you know, come and be the PRO. You speak well, you'll be on the PRO. And I used to go um, promote Corley Corner, and, and then um, Corley Corner really good back in the day. And then I get into the whole thing of camping for Mr. Menard in 1995. Wow. The Freedom Party lost the election. They lost the election. <laughs> Did Mr. Menard win his seat? Mr. Menard won his seat. I was his campaign manager, and um, he won his seat. And um, in, uh, that was 1995. Mm -hmm. Now I left my job because it looked like they had planned for me to be some junior minister or senator. If, if, if the Freedom Party had won. Yeah, and, and I remember people like Johnson Boston, you know, I was like, hey, to him. And I was like, what a great guy, Johnson Boston. One of the, one of the greatest person I ever met. And then um, we, we lost the lecture. So now what? Right? <laughs> or oh, you can't get a job, this and that, this and that. Let me ask though, let me ask. Yeah. So about how young were you at the time when you took on this responsibility to be Mr. Maynard's um, campaign manager? Do you remember? Yeah, no, everybody's going to know all of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, give us a range. Give us a range. So, early 20s? Um, I was in my 20s. You were in your 20s when you did that? Yeah. You took on this, this responsibility. What did it entail for you back then, if you recall? It was actually a good, good experience for me. Um, I became the office person manager and I had two other people, a young lady from Point Michel and a young lady from Sufre. And what I learned a lot from it, if you put yourself around good people, you do things for the right reason, mm -hmm. don't worry about the payment. Mm -hmm. The payment is what I'm getting right now to tell us. So do you think at the time what you were doing, it was for the right reason? It was for the right reason because I won, wanted to see a different kind of Freedom Party action in super constituency. Mm -hmm. And the Freedom Party was a dominant constituency. And I remember this question, Mr. Mayor, we have to change things. And I went in there to give people new hope that we have to do better. Mm -hmm. And there were plans in place, um, recommendations I made if they were to form the government. And they were going to do that. Um, I was sure it was going to get done. So I really, um, I think it was a good exercise. And, and you know, I get to the young guy, I get to see the whole of Dominica for free, you know. Mm -hmm. but, because, <laughs> because the thing about it back then, the Freedom Party, what they do for the company manager, you, they pay for half of your fear. Right. You know, young guy, you know, you're going around with the people and all of that. So that was good. I get to see a lot of places in Dominica. And then um, when there was the election, it was interesting. Um, I remember. Were you surprised? Actually, to be honest with you, I was not. And um, there's a guy um, who also I come for him, was Frederick Barron. I had a discussion with him and, and um, Mr. Boston. I said to them that, you know, what is going on in the Freedom Party? It was a young chap. You know, I remember Harry and I had a heated discussion <laughs> about that. And um, I said to them, what happened when they transfer of power? It's going to be difficult. And I think that 15 years in government, you know, even years of uh, support the Freedom Party then was like, you know, change may not be a bad thing. And then um, when they lost the election, um, I think they lost the election because a lot of people thought they had won the election already before. Because in 1995, then 2000, the same thing happened. And the UWP did a really good job in the super constituency hall building. And I was company leader for Frederick Barron, so I get myself a political thing I can't get out, right? 
So in 1995, when the Lord's election in 96, I went to work on a cruise ship. So me still me and I... So was that the only option? Because once you get yourself involved in politics... That's a serious fact. That's, listen, that's I mean, fact. because you, 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 what are you going to do unless you work for yourself? Yep. The, 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 the governing, the party that won is not going to hire you. It, it They're is. not going to give you a job. It was, and I remember that, you know, which I don't want to get into this, but yeah, when the party <laughs> from the government, some of the supporters are, and I always say to people about that is, it's not, a lot of times, not the people in the government or have crit uh, critical roles, but the supporters are the ones who cause the issues on the ground. Mm -hmm. And some of the soldiers in the people, they say some really not nice things, but I didn't take that to heart. And um, I remember it with Mr. James, and you look at me and you say, no potential. We could talk, but I went to I went to work on a cruise ship. Uh, Mr. Um, Gary Ed, uh, Mr. Ed, and uh, Mr. Miller, they organized something for me, and I went to work on the cruise ship. And interesting enough, when I came back after one year, I went to see Mr. Uh, Mr. Ed, and um, he looked at me like, "What is your problem? Why you come and say thanks to me?" I said, "Well, I appreciate you know um, the opportunity." And sadly enough, Mr. Ed looked at me in the eye and said to me. You know, young Bella, you are the only person who will ever come back to say thank you with all the hundreds of people we have helped you get a job in the country. And after this day, Mr. N and I have a good relationship mm -hmm. and Mr. Boyd, Jason, and Daniel. Mm -hmm. So, like, like we church me know what to do because they give me this opportunity. And when I walked to work, when I worked on the cruise ship, I went on. And, you know, Jeff Bullock is a competitive guy. In, in 2000, I said, Mr. Byron, I'm going to be your company manager. I took vacation from the crochet. And you came down? I came in 1999. That was the first Christmas I got to spend in Dominica. You remember in 2000, everybody thought the world was going to come to an end. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I was in Dominica after three and a half years on the cruise ship. So I came and I was company manager for Petri Byron. And I went and my cousin, this is Denis Lavasse, was the candidate for the government. Yes. And um, my father was a camping manager, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, wow, this is so incredible. So, so your dad and I would have what we call um, a rum shop meetings. Mm. <laughs> and so we would have really good discussion. But one of the things that a lot of people don't know about your dad is that people, everybody make mistakes. But one of the things I really appreciate getting to know him um, is that he gave me some stories. And one of them was that when he first got a job, I think it was DDS, he said, he used to walk that road in the middle of the night and they used to always make him scared or some zombie gonna scare him or something with the picture. And he told me that what I'm doing is, is really good for a lot of work. And he said to me after the election, uh, I used to be here and still came to me, your dad came to me and said, you know, Mr. Bella, look, we, we formed the government, that was in, in 95. Mm -hmm. But congratulations to you, well. And when Dennis Lamassey ran, he lost, and the UWP actually lost in 2000. He, uh, you know, like some of these folks, um, even before, before the 2000 election, your dad was one of those persons, you know, always look at me and say, I want you to know, just no blood. Mm -hmm. And I, I that meant a lot to me. And so once in a while, <laughs> um, I remember you were Google <laughs> said for the first time you never heard it. Um, he said to me, My son, I said, Yeah, you got a pretty daughter, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> even to this day, even to this day, your stepmom joined Pondisha whenever I drive by, I always drop him out. <laughs> yes, oh my God, it's the first time I'm hearing that story. <laughs> Well, I guess that's one of the things that was said to you that didn't come through, right? There you go, there you go. Did that to you? Maybe I don't know. Okay. Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, but but um, this, this is really kind of yes, like a lot of selectmen fall yeah. and mm -hmm. Byron won the election. Oh, so you I won. won. Byron yes. won the seat. Mr. Miller won the seat. Mr. Byron won the seat. And I remember I told to Byron that you know Point Michelle is is an interesting place. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, you know, you need to do work on the ground with Point Michel. Mm -hmm. And he like, oh, Jeff, I won that seat already. Mm -hmm. what you want. So I went to the Point Michel and I did some work. And um, actually, Byron lost in Point Michel and Sufre. And he lost in Sufre about two or three votes. And I went to him and I said, you're going to win this election. And Scott said, I'm going to help you win. Mm -hmm. And you're going to win. I think I thought he was going by 96, 97. I can't remember exactly. And so said, so done. 
I was on by one vote. And the reason I was on by one vote is because the person who voted for Frederick Byron wrote his name on the ballot. <laughs> So, so, so that was my political thing as a young guy. Yes. Growing. And then I, you know, I get back to the cruise ship. Before you, you go to the cruise ship, what did the political experience teach you? Um, first with Mr. Mina and then with um, Frederick Barrett. Two very different individuals. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mina was a very well put together guy, mm -hmm. very calm guy, and down to earth. What I really learned from Mr. Mina is that anything you want to do, you have to keep at it. And he always look at the bigger picture. Byron was a different guy. Byron was a very aggressive grown guy. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, like you know, he's a people's person as well. He is more about, you know, like let's do this, let's do that and, and, and stuff. And, and I really learned a lot from both of them. Mm -hmm. It was the the men of camping was calm and relaxed. The Byron camping was if you like, ooh, you came from Buyo to Siho, mm -hmm. so to speak about it. <laughs> so, so I, that's, that's one of my things. And also, the other thing I learned too was the leadership style, because back then you had a different level of political party. So, um, I, and I learned a lot from the opposition forces, the Labour Party and the United Workers Party back then too. So, so, it was a very good experience for me, um, mm -hmm. and I honestly have no regret about it. Did any of these um, individuals or being involved in the campaign, did you have any self-motivation to want to run yourself at some point in the future? Uh, did you, did you uh, develop any political aspirations yourself? I did. You did? I did. Um, I remember that um, uh, Mr. Man, I don't know, I think I'll be second time I said it publicly, came to me um, and when the Labour Party actually was looking for candidates. Uh, the Labour Party? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, they, came, they were looking for a candidate for the super constituency because what happened, Mr. Barron run, right? And then he left. And then they had, uh, I think it was Ian Pina that run. Mm -hmm. So before they selected Ian Pina, uh, the Prime Minister then, who is now Prime Minister now, Prime Minister Honorable Arias, called me. Uh, I like to call my initials for the step. Mm -hmm. And um, he called me and um, he said, well, to talk with me. I'm a young child. Um, you know, in 2002, I had kids, you know, and then um, Mr. Mena, uh, my brother, who's a statistician, former statistician, a central statistic, mm -hmm. um, was there, Mr. Mena at the time was ambassador to Caraca, and he said to my brother, before Jeff talked to the Prime Minister, please have him come see And I went to see him, and sat me down. Um, you know, with my kid mom, American, Caucasian lady, and said to us, you know, I know you guys want to go back and that's great, but I will not advise you right now to run right now in Dominica with currently this political party, the leadership and everything. It's only that. And, you know, may so rest in peace. And he was ambassador Caricom, and he said to me that this guy was a really man of God. He said to me, you know, Jeff, here's the thing. The kind of people get into politics these days is a matter of time. There's going to be people with, like, oh, his exact word was, the kind of people get into politics now is a matter of time. Parliament become a war zone. As people are getting angry and angrier, they might start bringing weapons and stuff. I'm not advising you too young for your farm if you and your kids to get in there. Well, about 10 years, 12 years later, that's what happened. And um, he, he cautioned me about that. And but I, you would have likely won, though, wouldn't you? Well, I, <laughs> I, mean, I have to be honest. I mean, we don't know. But I, I know, have to be honest. I didn't, the trend I, didn't, the I most likely would say, yeah, I have to be honest. The trend I would have won. But I have been contacted by all three political parties to win the super constituency. Mm -hmm. And when they say what they want about the current premise or the current opposition leader, but I think they both understand the values that someone like me or very similar could bring into parliament or for the constituency. I don't see colors for that. I don't see green, I don't see blue, I don't see red. Mm -hmm. I believe in what is right. Um, just yesterday, an event was held for remembering two great guys, Big A and Mighty Eka. And when I did that first thing, and I'll make this public too, that I called the power months ahead and she didn't respond. I didn't call her back. I had the same situation with the Prime Minister and I didn't call her back. He didn't call me, I didn't call her back. I believe that you have, you know, I need to respect you, you also need to respect me. 
and then she in the call back and say what's up and we spoke and I said da, 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 da. I could have said I don't want to talk to you now I'm like we're having this evening for these two guys you're the power I would like to be part of it and she said you know yeah what can we do together and great we did for big and bigger um, thanks to people like Wadix and Krill and we did that and it went smoothly mm -hmm. I took a walk to his seat and you know, and then people see me as a threat, as a political candidate. I don't believe in political parties. Mm -hmm. I believe in dominator. Mm -hmm. And I am saying, with all the three political parties who contacted me, I can say it tonight. And I was about to ask you, if you were to run for one, which one would it be? I, there's only one political party in Dominica that caught my heart, and that is Dominica Freedom Party. And, and even yesterday in church, the, the, the they were talking about whether gentle or Jew, whether you're mm -hmm. or one. He said to me, Jeff, you're a freedom writer, right? What about you? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I believe that I believe that um, you know we have to we have to do what we think is best for us in which party. Mm -hmm. The freedom party definitely would be my clearer choice because I know their history, I know their policies, I understand it. And when I look at the two political parties in Dominica right now, for them to the type from, I look at the cat and mouse here. I look at two political parties, kind of like someone is chasing you, I'm chasing you, and whenever I know that guy is chasing you, I'm with you. That's when I want to be affectionate. But when he's not, I'm not. And, I, I, and because just recently I listened to Parliament on a simple, simple thing where there was an issue about a bill that was passed. I can't remember exactly what it was. And I think what the legal position will recognize, the keyword was missing. And the Prime Minister you know, kind of brushed it aside. Whereas the Minister Blackmore, who put the bill forward, recognized there was an error and he fixed it. I give him credit. I see Mr. Blackmore right now, shake his hand and say, good job. This is what I'm interested in too. We are not too big or too small to be wrong. And when I look at the political parties in Dominica, the two main political parties we have in Dominica, one they say we need change and this or that. But what is change? What kind of change are we looking for? In, in, I listen to the debate sometimes, and I wonder if they are the fish market. They are taking very cheap shots at each other. I think the government needs to do a much better job in reaching out to the opposition. And I also believe the opposition need also to do a better job when they go to parliament, not just to criticize every bill, but try to meet them in the middle. Nothing is wrong in after this and call and say, hey, you know, I see what you're trying to do, but can you meet us there? And, I, and, and I, that's a problem I have right now with two political parties. This is something that needs to change. And there are great people here, educated people. There are people you know, who can do very well there. But I just find that it's a cat and mouse game. And this game is not fear for the people of Dominica. It is not fear. And if I could get into politics, to be a member of parliament, one of the things I would try to do very well to change that issue of this fighting back and forth is to invite whoever sides together. Let's have tea time, let's 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 discourse, let's let you know, even if I'm the on the opposition side, let's go let's go to your constituency and let's meet the people and let's see what is right. Mm -hmm. Unless we do that, unless we change the mindset of power. Unless we change the mindset of, I'm the one making the decision, who are you? We are not going to get anywhere. And it's affecting all young people. I have to ask you, Jeff, so you spoke about the two main political parties in Dominica now, making reference to the Dominic Labour Party and the opposition United Workers Party. Now, your heart is with the Dominica Freedom Party. Um, you did not m mention or acknowledge the Dominica Freedom Party as one of the main parties. What has happened to the Dominica Freedom Party and where do you see the Fre Dominica Freedom Party going from here? Well, I mentioned the two main opposition parties because they're one in Parliament. I think that the Dominica Freedom Party has the best chance to outsee the Labour Party in all my state. Uh -huh. and, and I can share some confident information. Um, with all the service that's been done, in Dominica, and if you look at it, does, it's not hard science. And I give you the political parties free advice right now. If you go to constituencies like Grand Bay, uh, Portsmouth, um, Salisbury, some of these constituencies has both one way, right? But look at the turn of every election, and what has happened? There's a lot of people in Dominica who has not been to the poll since the Freedom Party has not contested the election. Rosa Central is, is a great example. 
So even in Sufre constituency, I know quite a bit of people in Scott said Sufre and Point Michel have not voted since 2000. I know these people. These are my people and I know them. I've been through this. When the last election was done, and I think it was power to his Sylvian stuff, and he said something critical. What he said was that when Mark asked him, so what do you think about the Freedom Party? He answered simply was the Freedom Party has some great stuff going for them on the ground. Now, and you know, they have the Henry and the Peter Wickham coming into Dominica, and they should not be able to beat us on the ground if our company. We should know our constituents. I'm very, con I'm very, very convinced that a strong Freedom Party um, with some financial resources has a very good chance in shocking the Labour Party in the Republican Party. I'm very convinced of it. The reason why I'm saying that, not because, like I said, the Freedom Party in my heart. I go around Dominica. Um, uh, you know, I own a country, and you know, I meet farmers around the country. And what I'm hearing from a lot of people, very interestingly, in even constituencies like Cottage, they are not voting because they are not happy with the options they have. And a lot of professionals in Dominica have had good discussions with them. They have said exactly the same thing. So we have a problem. We have a political crisis in Dominica. But the bigger problem, I believe, and being someone involved in politics, is that I feel like a lot of people want change. Both they want to see maybe the opposition or the government. They are not making themselves forward. They talk. But they don't really want to make that change. And I understand that because in between me, young guy, got young kids, my oldest is 17 and my youngest is 12. And to enter political arena, Mr. Men of One, that's, that's, that's brutal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you cannot be a candidate and you can make you know, some sort of assistance available or recommendation, do that. Mm -hmm. No, do the political parties want to listen? That's why I look at the Freedom Party as, the, as a good alternative. I listen to all the radio, political radio shows, and what I do, when I listen to people like Bosso, they talk about issues. They don't attack people individually. They talk about issues, and this is one of the things I like about them. So, so the political arena in Dominica, people ask the question, is there any room for a new political party? Mm -hmm. I think there is room for a new alternative. And I listen to um, a few folks who, who spoke um, the Afi Martin this guy, they have good intentions. But the reality is that our problem is the two political parties in Dominica are playing this cat and mouse game unless they start that. And just recently I heard the Loftus Bureau said something interesting is that unless the opposition forces work well together, we're not gonna see a change problem. And it's correct. Because opposition the oppo main opposition party in parliament has to recognize that we keep making the same thing. What can we do better? And give them credit. I mean this guy the leader of the opposition now, he didn't throw up. And he's still standing. I'll give him some credit for that. At the same time, when I look at the government side, I just felt like more can be done. And I, I'm speaking down the middle here because I have friends on both sides of the Labour Party and the United Workers Party. I'm really, really with these guys. Mm -hmm. But what I want to see in Dominica is something uplifting, something different. Let's talk this, you know, this, you said this and you said that and Let's change that concept. Let's, let's have panel discussions. Let's have debates. Unless we can do that, the public is already getting a true taste of who they're voting for. And I think it's about time um, people that work in the media are able to bring those political parties, political leaders together and start having political debates where questions can be asked. And even like the police have those panel discussions with the police. Look at crime. I am feeling safer in the walking Wisconsin than Rosa Dominica right now. I, I'm serious. How many murders we have now? 13 so far for the year, I think. That's ridiculous. A small population like this. So we need to look at policies that can change this thing instead of looking at party colors. And I think it's about time the Labour Party, the United Workers Party, the Freedom Party really meet and discuss issues. Why are our challenges? Why are our young people are behaving this way? What can we do? What can we do collectively to stop this? And if we cannot do that, then let me tell you, we have a serious, serious road to serious issues down the road for young people. What happened? We don't have the junior secondary program anymore. The kids don't come to the college. These areas need to seriously look back into our education system. 
And this is what I'm calling on, on the opposition forces and the government to look at seriously. Because our young people are not getting the training they need. And we as parents of today are not really setting in a good example for our children. People say children these days. Right? What about parents these days? If you live in my house, you're not going to tell me the way you want to live. If you live in my house, these are the rules. And that's where I feel like for the child as parents. All right. We are live with Jeff Bellot, and there's still so much more to come. But in interesting, interesting points there in terms of the politics coming from um, the age of uh, being campaign mm. managers. Um, my final question for you on this, um, do you intend at any point uh, contesting elections here in Dominica in the future? I do have high interest. You have in, high interest? In contesting the super constituents. I have great interest. I've always made it clear. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to come down to, you know, those kids, you know, the kids of mine, uh, Meda and Jeff and Jack, uh, I have Jeff Jr. as well. <laughs> and, um, you know, my mom always said to me, you need to think about this one. Mm -hmm. Once the time is right, and you keep the super constituents, you put the blessings. That's great. And if it had to be to run as an independent candidate, I can mm -hmm. also do that. Mm -hmm. But I do have a high interest mm -hmm. in running in the super constituency. Are you, are you a US citizen? Well, that is a very good question. Um, actually, I actually filed in 19, it was in 2019, when I thought of running for the Freedom Party, I reclassified uh, my status. And what does that mean, Jeff? Break uh, that down. What does that mean is that we reclassify the stars to a green card so that if I could run for election, I could run. So the way it works because of the kind of taxes I pay in the U.S., being a business owner in the U.S., the way it works is that um, you can decline and get that back if you wish to. But I um, um, actually, it's interesting because in two years, I'm going to have to make the decision to get the US citizenship back or to stay on my green card. So um, I did that uh, because I was really looking at running into the last election. Interesting. This is interesting. And, um, I, and, and this is the thing because I really think when I look at the last election and um, a lot of stuff went on that should not have happened and um, I just pulled up from it. So the, the intention is there. And I, I said this, a lot of people probably surprised at that. Yes. And every time I come to Dominica, yeah. they stump my passport. I said, do you realize you're stumping my Dominican passport when I leave? So if I run to election, remember that you're going to be my witness. I said, the immigration <laughs> officers, they all laugh, right? Oh my goodness, this is interesting. This is interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm happy that you're sharing that here with us. And I guess we, it's just left to be seen, you know, what's going to happen in time to come. We're going to take a quick break. Remember this conversation actually started off when we spoke about Jeff working, um, uh, working on the cruise ship. So we need to take it from there, go back and take it back from where you left to go to work um, on the cruise ship after you came down from um, being Frederick Barron's man campaign manager, you then went back on the cruise ship, yes. right? So we're going to take it back. We're going to take it out from there um, when we come back from this very, very short um, break. Keep it up. This is the In the Spotlight Radio Show. Good conversation there with Jeff Bellot. In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every morning night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. Featuring people from all walks of Dominican life, spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, aspirations, untold stories. Touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Get it to know our fathers, our public servants, youth, and the ordinary Dominica. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight will also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. Thank you. 
interviews here at Q95 FM Radio. Remember to follow the In The Spotlight Radio Show page. Go there and you will also see the video where we're speaking to our Classroom Ready Set Go Scholarship, which is being provided by one of the supporters of the In The Spotlight Radio Show page. And we say thank you to her as well um, for her contribution to the education of a student here in Dominica who just um, passed the or just sat the national assessment exams. I also just want to say um, extend condolences to another huge fan of the show and that's David Joseph and David recently lost his mom so we just want to reach out to David tonight and to let him know that he's in our prayers and our thoughts. I know that um, putting together funeral arrangements for a loved one, I had to do it for both my mom and my dad, can be very, very difficult and challenging. So we really want you to know that you are in our thoughts and our prayers and we wish you, um, you know, uh, control and, 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 and um, strength as you, you deal with all of this. So just wanted to shout out David Joseph there and to my dearest lady, um, who is making this scholarship available through the In The Spotlight radio show called Classroom Ready, Set, Go. Looking forward to doing more things with you, my dear lady. Back to Jeff Bellot in the studios here at Q95, and we are also live on the In The Spotlight radio show's page, and we thank you for joining us, whichever platform that you're using here tonight. So, Jeff, before we, we ventured out into the world of politics, and Jeff, uh, we were actually speaking about um, when you went back to the cruise ship for the mm -hmm. second time. So, you went back to work on the cruise ship. What were you doing there? So, when I came back to company from Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, I took extra vacation. And I had to go to Costa Rica to do a course for our Caribbean because I want to work. Because when I went to the cruise ship, and in 96, I was cleaning the floors. You were cleaning the floors? Yes, I was what they call a night cleaner. Clean the floors. The soup, big old soup. Six of us could probably fit in the soup pots. And I went to Royal Caribbean and then I went to Potwash. And then from Potwash, I came back. And then they look at me and they said, you know, we want you to be one of the supervisors, one they call, um, I can't remember the name, but it, it's one of the supervisors for the for the folks who um, do all the cleaning the utility guys so um, one of the supervisors for that they could use to call that position one bar because the person had a one strike from them and then um, they look at me and then I said okay I'll look at that so they wanted to send me to Costa Rica to a, a program so I said to them going to the certification so the deal was if you come back at a later time you really want to do the course it's going to cost you 500 or something US dollars to go. But you know a lot of money back then. I'm like, you know what? I really want to show for them that we can come in again. And I came up. And I came to my right. So you gave up? I took extra vacation. Then I had to put that 500 US dollars from my pocket. Yeah. So I went and I campaigned with Mr. Uh, and I can make this public. I said, Mr. Barron, here's the deal. I'll campaign for you, but this is what I have to do. He said, Jeff, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so I came back. And Was then, it fair enough? It, it figured it out. It figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back and um, camped in for him, and then I went back to the cruise ship. And shortly after that, um, we had this um, program to the Royal Caribbean, which I did. And um, so they had this ABC map. Um, and then I got an A, and then they said to me that we're not going to send you to Rica anymore. You don't have to pay for that. And we actually want you um, to go to Marseille, France. And I'm like, what's that? They said, well, you're going to go to France. You know, when the ship comes out, you're going to train the new people. So I worked there and I, a little bit and I came back and then I moved into Dish Room, Watch that. Then I became a supervisor you, you of the cruise into what? what they call Dish Room. So like I was washing the dishes as well. Oh my goodness. So I really worked my so way out. So you clean the floors, you wash dishes. Put some pans, clean dishes, oh. take garbage out, mm -hmm. and then become the supervisor. And then I went to that program and skipped me. And then, then this young lady um, from Canada, Diane was the name, um, one of the hotel manager um, on um, South of America then came to me and said, you know, like, we've been watching you, um, you know, every time there's a meeting, they want to tell the things, they know what it's being asked, you're like, okay, okay, and then, you know, we have a lot of guys from different islands, and, you know, like, English was very difficult for them, mm -hmm. so it was easier for me to speak English, and then I went back, and then, so I moved up into the bar, assistant bartender, and then I was, again, um, 
they tell you have to step down. So I was collecting the glasses for the bar, what they call the bar boy. Wash the bar boys and at night. So what I used to do smartly at night, I used to stay up and throw all the glasses I can wash it in my mind stack. So I get extra sleep. And when the ship is in port, I get to go out. So that's the kind of game I have to play. And then I end up being a bartender from there. And then um, but before that, something uh, kind of romantic happened. I was on a cruise ship. And I met this lady and then we would talk and they talk and then you know she was from Wisconsin and then you know we, we started talking to each other and um, it was right before I went to Captain for Bahar. We met in Thanksgiving of 1999. And I said to her, you know, don't worry, I'll call it. It will be a long time because I knew my plan. She didn't be the one to call her. So when I came back from, remember I left in December and I didn't go back till March after the elections. And I called her and she was shocked. And then we started talking and we started dating. And the rest of the history, we had three kids, three beautiful kids, lovely kids. Mm -hmm. And then, um, she, you know, you're a woman, you're homeless, but she goes, well, um, how this is going to work out? Because, you know, I'm all the way to Wisconsin, you know, crochet. You know, I need to know what my chances with you before mm -hmm. I got the kids. I said, well, was, was, she, was she cruising? That's what she came on the cruising for that. Oh. And then I was got fired. So what happened? Hmm. I went to clean the bar. And that's why young people have to realize when something goes wrong, pray about it. And it may be a reason why these things happen. I clean the bar and then somebody make a mess. And I went back out so mad, I swear, and this and that. And then I came out so upset, I had a game in my hand. And I saw this lady walking in this long skirt, not even like to say, like, attracting me right away. And I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. So I tried to hide the dream. <laughs> she came to me, she said, hi. I said, hi. Um, and I'm trying to hide my name tag. And she's going to report me that she caught me drinking. And I said, oh, they call me the breeze around here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just make that in? They used to call me the breeze for sure. Oh, okay. for real, because I used to walk so far and they said the breeze is blowing back. So we, we that's all we met. And then um, we start talking, communicating, and um, she's like, you know, uh, asking me, like, hey, are we going to take this serious or not? I'm like, well, yeah, I need some time to think about it. And then, you know, I let her, yeah, I, I let her know, hey, you know, I grew up as a single mom. You know, I need to take care of my mom. Um, this is very important to me. And, you know, if you're not going to have kids, whether married or not, whatever. You know, my mom had to be taken care of, and she agreed to that. And then she went back to Wisconsin, and then I went to visit her and then to see this place. I mean, I thought of Wisconsin, not realizing it's so close to Chicago, you mm -hmm. know, and Milwaukee is kind of, it's like Rosa to Father Fox in Milwaukee in Chicago. And then um, when I went there, I see the job. I said, if you get me a job, um, I'll, I'll move to Wisconsin. Not knowing she had plans, and she got a, I got a job there. And again, I start all over again. I had to, I was mopping the floor, oh. sweeping the floor, picking up 50 pound bags, and the guy there, a job with the left of my supervisor, said, well, you know, you can do this, you know, you're a smart guy. So I figured this out, and then I worked my way out uh, for a small company called Active Products, and then I became the uh, production supervisor. Then I became the production manager, and they were doing really good stuff, microbiology stuff. That's how I get into science. So when everybody go home, you know, my kids don't matter the time at the lab. She was the lab manager. She was, she was a very bright scientist. So I would stay in the afternoon and read those books about bacteria. I could even say pentocious, active the lactose. I used to bite my tongue saying these things, trying to break it down with silver. And I really learned a lot about probiotics right there on the job. So I learned about probiotics and I'm like, this is fascinating. You can kill a good bacteria with a bad, you can kill a, a bad bacteria with a good bacteria without using antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So that's how I learned that. Then I went to Milwaukee Area Technical College. I got a GED there and I had to do some other classes. So that's how I got a GED. So I did get a GED after you all. You got your GED <laughs> after all, which is equivalent to a high school education sure. in Dominica. Yes. And then from there I did some courses, some science class at Milwaukee Area Technical College. And um, it, it was brutal because you have to do very simple English stuff. I mean, it was to see me like you know mm -hmm. she has they have mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the American language and then um, from there the, what got very interesting was that um, the company sold to a Danish company Danish school so Danish school now sold to I take so but um, sold to Danish school Danish school now came in and said you know if you are you know a hundred fifty thousand dollar customer you know, we don't work with you then, uh, about a year after, actually, I brought the family to Dominic on our way back. Um, my brother-in-law at the time worked for DuPont, 
call mm -hmm. us and say, hey, I'm going to be the boss because DuPont just bought your company. I was like, what? So that happened, and DuPont came in and they changed a lot of stuff. Um, because of the managing structure, I came from production manager back to be a, 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 a supervisor, not even a supervisor, like a production lead. And my boss had to become a supervisor. And then DuPont said, anybody who's a part of a million dollars, $250,000, if you don't buy that wolf of product from us, you're going to have to buy everybody's stock. I look at her and I said to her, and my kid's mom, I said, look, we can send our kids to school if we get 10 customers at, at, at $50,000. Unfortunately, again, she, uh, I got turned down and she said to me, are you crazy? Do you understand how much wolf this is? I look at her and I said, sweetheart, I'm from Dominica. Now, I pray about and I really do the grace of God, nothing is impossible. She said, you can tell me all you want. And she's not really like a big Christian person. And I said, I know we can do this. She didn't want to do it. I started, I went ahead. And we started our little company. She finally came aboard, and we came with the name, like some, we wanted, I wanted some pure Dominic, I wanted something Dominic. So I came out with the name Wasim. No, Wasim. So we did the research, how would it be called Wasim, we really spelled R-A-C-I-N. Unfortunately, there's a ton of Wisconsin to called Racim. So people will say racing, so we played with the word and give a credit, she designed it, and then we started with that. We started this company, and I'm like, okay, we're not gonna take any money for us first year. So what really happened then, the company, um, she lost a position. Now they transferred me to Rochester, New York, and they realized, you know, what the man's doing, so they wanted to keep me. I'm like, no, I'm gonna do my own business. They don't follow up. So we started this company in 2013, just making product. Mm -hmm. What type of product? So we, we, we started with customers of product product. So one of the things was that we do is that um, we design product for the ag industry. So back in the day, and people still use that, what they call antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So if your animal is sick, like we're talking about, remember we're talking the US, we're talking about farms with, you know, 20, 30,000 cows, mm -hmm. you know, not just something chicken, mm -hmm. you know. And then if these birds get sick, what they would do, they would use an antibiotic. Uh, to help solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But the technology we used was that it is antibiotic and then antibiotic actually get into the human. So then your body becomes resistant to antibiotic whenever you get a prescription from the doctor. So the technology we use was probiotic. So probiotic, what it does, probiotic increases the good bacteria and then it decreases the bad bacteria. So when this whole COVID thing came up, probiotic became a big thing, but probiotic been around a long time. So what it really works, in our body, we have enzymes, we have all kind of bacteria, good bacteria, bad bacteria. So the whole thing about the immune system really is that when you talk about the immune system is weak, well, when the bad bacteria take over, you get sick, right? Because you know, you're not feeling well. Mm -hmm. So probiotic, when you take it, what it does, it increases the good bacteria in your system to find the bad bacteria. So this is exactly when it started with animals and that's what we did for a long time. And you say that was your business? It's Jeff right. Bellot and yep. his lady. Yep. You started that business. We started that. And then we, we went with that and some of this already started. But then what we did neatly, mm -hmm. we went after the private and label customers. Mm -hmm. So we went after the private label customers. So we make product for the diner, we make product for John Paul, we make product for Mr. G. But interestingly, for Diana and Mr. G could be competing in the same market. But they mm -hmm. don't know that I'm making product for them. <laughs> Because every one of you have a very unique formulation. So, for example, you would come and say to me, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Bell, here's my problem. Um, I got these farmers in Portsmouth, and you know, every one of them in the Portsmouth area, their birds are dying after two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, what we would do, we set up a team, we'll go to your farm, we'll take samples of the water, sample of the feed, sample of the feces, and we'll take one or two birds in the different areas, we'll bring them to the lab. You know, we slaughter them and then we will diagnose those labs and you know we'll process and see. So we we'll find the bacteria. So when we screen that bacteria, what we will do, we use a probiotic to screen against that bad bacteria, and that's how we make the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's very unique to you. I understood. So Mr. G could probably have a problem with birds in Port Michel, but it is probably something in the air, something else different. So he's although we make a good product for you guys, but your formulation is unique. His formulation is unique because one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that even if Dominic is a small island, if you drink water in, in Sufres content back in the day, very sulfury water, then you go to, let's say, lower than drink water, it's very different. Now, the one's good chance is going to be how do we 
which came out of the user one to use, is a very similar concept. Yes, yes. So, so, so this is how we, we, we started this um, thing, and then we grew this business. So I remember um, after the first year, I got a call from this guy. Um, he was like $500 in sales. He called and said, you guys are going to be in business next year. I'm like, that's the plan, of course. And then um, he became our biggest customer. And then we started growing from there, and then we expanded and that's what we really do now. And we added another side of science to it. As you might have said, we really, really um, research and development. We do a lot of monitoring work. Um, we, would, um, we would bring anything, we look at it, and we tell you what's the problem. And one of the work we did in the very early chief stages was it was um, different environment. The COVID was around. Um, you know, we look at a lot of it. We, we did work, um, you know, understand how it worked and all of that. So that was quite interesting. That's so why I was able to get all this knowledge about the virus. <laughs> so um, the immunology jam, um, jam, um, lab and the molecular lab we have is this unit because we separated from the manufacturing plant. So establishing this kind of thing, doing that work, it, it's fascinating. And when I look at Dominica today, and that's one of the things that inspired me, we started carrying feed in Dominica. It's a company to make certain feed. So we started selling feed. Here. And then the fee was coming from the US, it was expensive because of transportation and then you have to pay a tariff mm -hmm. on that. So then we were like, okay, what can we do? We look at the situation after Hurricane Maria. I actually coordinated um, um, Mr. Gill from um, Gill's Hatchery to come to Dominic, the Metal Ministry of Agriculture, and we had a meeting with them on how we could resolve this, and nothing happened from that. So I realized, you know, there's a need to that government, too many red tape, I just bypassed everything. And I went ahead and started with a hatchery, come up with the cash, mm -hmm. buy the equipment. And we have a hatchery in Dominican Sanctuary today where we bring in eggs into Dominica. And we hatch the eggs. Well, we incubate the eggs and then hatch them. And we are able to sell one day, two day old chicks, vaccinate them after, and the farmers are having them very great success with it. And um, it's, How long ago were you? We started that last year, March of last year. So we okay. have the first original hatchery on the island. And this is why agriculture. It's so important to me because when we speak about agriculture, we intend to think of cashing and feed. Mm -hmm. Take more to agriculture. But then uh, I, I put these numbers together. Um, so according to the Central Statistics Division, mm -hmm. we are importing over 12 million US dollars of our poultry into Dominica. 10 million. 12. 12 million if annually? Yeah. And this number is probably higher because that was kind of like I um, read before or after Maria. $1 million. I believe what we can do in Dominica, in, we need to look at, and this is what we must talk about policies. I think agriculture needs to be seriously looked at. And we can really decrease our importation bill a lot. We have a hatch on the island, we have an abattoir. That's an advanced stage. What we need to do is to separate the abattoir, I believe, from government. It can still be a subsidy, but the abattoir should have its own financial institute, like it should be independent, kind of how doors go around. So they have, the, because the problem they're having is that the abortion is getting the chicks from the farmers, but the farmers are not getting paid on time. Well, it's not really the abortion form because the government system, because it has to go through the treasury, then you have to get the check approved, and so on and so forth. But while the farmer is waiting, well, which church is waiting? Esmat is waiting. So then is waiting for a chicken, right? That is putting a, a lot of pressure on the farmers. So I would recommend to these guys that the abattoir should be independent, that its financial resources should be on its own. So when people come, they can the farmers can get the money right away. And then therefore you keep that growth. Now imagine you go on a serious project. I have always thought about World Bank gives the government money to do this and that. It's strategy. How do you strategize the system? And my recommendation to them here is is this. I will take the mantle. Our Dominican budget is over a billion dollars right now. I would volunteer my time. If the government, the opposition forces, they come together and say, if you're serious about agriculture in Dominica, out of this billion dollars, in July will be the budget, out of the billion dollars, $250 million from that, I will volunteer a lot of my time, pay for my expense to travel, and put that $250,000, $250 million to work in agriculture. Our first step would be livestock, pork farmers, and rabbit farmers. You build that. The first year will be hard because you have to bring all this data together. You need to find out how many poultry farmers you have in layers, 
in brightness. You need to find out how many pig farmers you have. You, may, you want to find out how many rabbit farmers you have. You want to find out all these um, different species. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the crops, short-term crops, long-term crops, root crop. So you have field extension offices working differently. You cannot have a, a livestock officer, field officer going to worry about bananas. This guy should be trained. That guy is a poultry guy, he's a poultry guy. Yes, you can do some cross training. You go in the family, but by the way, I see this banana tree, I see this bug, that's what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. But unless they can do that, we're not going to be able to get out of the way. We talk, always talk about the culture. And I will volunteer my time. If the government can put $250 million for the next budget into agriculture, a special project to into agriculture to work on food security, and $50 million every year after that minimum to boost this thing, I can guarantee that in five years, we can have very close to 10,000 jobs. Somebody's going to maybe listen and say, Jeff, you're crazy. You're a mad man. Here's the numbers. Math in public. If you're going to calculate again, if you start with 10 farmers, just poultry mm -hmm. and bread. Ten, if you start with 10 farmers, each farmer hire 10 people, that's 100 jobs. Imagine 100 farmers, 10 people, that's 1,000 jobs. You got tens of that, you see your 10,000 jobs come very easily. And this is just new jobs. Not even looking at indirect jobs, like the, the logistic guy, the guy who's going to be driving the boat from point A to point B, the guy who's going to be wrapping it in the abattoir, the guy who's going to be feeding it. We have the potential to do that. With my experience what within the US, I see Dominic is a place. If we do this right, we should be a leader in, this, in, the, in the Caribbean, just like where we were, the way the Philippine the government is in farming healthcare, in agriculture. Livestock has a lot of money. And for the young people listening to me tonight, I want to say to them, think, when you think agriculture, don't think of all this hard work. You can go into poultry. You can go into other livestock areas. And Give yourself a chance. Instead of trying to stay on the street side or, or trying to get those Vespa bikes or, and stuff like that hanging out, you know, come up with a plan. Look at something you can do for yourself. And, and look, I saw some young people recently selling candles. Mm -hmm. And they asked me if I want to buy and this. And I started talking prayer to them. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh, so I didn't realize you're from here. I'm like, well, of course. And I spoke to this young man. And I, it's a great story. The guy said to me, you know, um, he has been involved in so many problems because he followed back companies and he showed his cars. He had got shot a few times. And um, you know, it's scary. And he said to me, you know, you just turn yourself to do something different. So I spoke to this young guy, but I actually gave him $10 and I took a few candles. And in talking to him, um, I spoke to him like, like last week. And today I saw him. Again, I ran into him. Mm -hmm. And he told me he went home. I gave him some seeds. He planted some tomato seeds. Mm. And he said to me, you know what? Agriculture is not that bad. I just have to wait and let it grow. That's it. These are the difference. I'm hoping after tonight, I can make a difference in somebody's life. To make them realize that dreams come true if you put the work into it. If you believe in doing it right. And we have so many young people out there right now who's trying to live in the system. They are frustrated. We as a people need to do better to look how we can get these young people, whether it's in agriculture using new technology, whether it is in education, making them come back. Some of them probably gone because if I'm one of them is legally done in Canada now, that doesn't have the young people. Mm -hmm. That is creating a problem. And a lot of the elderly are very upset about it because these young people are smoking or outside. And you know, you have people with health conditions. It's not a very good thing for them. Again, I don't get the political side. Yes, of it. yes. But the reality is that instead of looking at areas, I mean, you, for, you know, you know, like um, above Polish so much land in the poor, above poor area, there's an area in Galia, there's an area called one in Cabot, Scotland. Instead of looking at these guys and say, look, why don't we, we have a college, we have a uh, Ross University. Why don't we look at this as a, 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 a science school or you know, of labs or, or do something here? We can bring in the testing. Get this young man, get some land available. If you really want to go into marijuana, plant it, and you can you can really control this if you do this right. If I give them uh, like five acres of land, five acres of land, and I say you only supposed to have a thousand plants, I supposed to go there. This is really, this is a training is important. Field officer, extension officer. Remember I mentioned that earlier mm -hmm. on. They go to that field, and their job is to count these plants to make sure he's not growing any actual. That would be illegal. 
And then you cultivate that. You use this for medical purposes. We, the roses is well equipped. You can use this way to do a lot of testing. And you can, you can have a cannabis business in a legal way. But when you make this available for young people to smoke marijuana, you're not helping them. It, it, it's not good for the elderly taking all the smell and smoke and all of that. Why are you hitting all of that? What about our, we, what I would like to find out, I would like to do some research and find out from the hospital. How many people have had secondhand smoke cancer or affected before marijuana become smoking legal in Dominica? And in five years to do it and see if the number goes up. I only surprised those are. But, but Jeff, um, one might argue that they smoked it anyway before um, making it legal for them to have, what, 28 ounces? Um, it's probably just allowing them to now freely smoke it in the open. Uh, one, yeah. Yeah, yes, one put a gear mm -hmm. But we have to look at the health aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Because they could smoke it and they have to hide from the police, right? right. But now imagine going to the city of Roseau, you have 500 people standing outside courts, which area. I mean, between the which church um, flow area there, there's just about 500 people almost every day okay, at, at one point. And you're smoking a pot, you know how many people get in secondhand smoke? And I can help myself because I do research. <laughs> and, 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 and when I look at this, when I look at this, is you are not sending the right message. And I think this is some. These are things that we need to look at. And our young people, we, we have opportunities for them, but we have to make the opportunities available. We need to forget about are you one of us? Are you one of them? And we need to look at I'm a Dominican. What can we do for our young people? We sometimes talk tough. Mm -hmm. We talk tough but we don't really put any actions into it. And, and you seem to be quite a bit passionate um, based on what you've been sharing this evening, um, where young people are concerned. Um, what is your current view as you, you, you walk around? I know you mentioned encountering the young man who was selling the chemic. What is your view on, on the, the, the status of young people in Dominica? Um, what would you like to see done for young people, um, education-wise, employment-wise? Uh, tell us more about that passion and what you would like to see happen with young people. I think we need to go back to the education system. I think we had something great in the 80s and 90s, and we stopped that. The whole thing of universal education, that's when it started, I think the year we started universal education, and now there's this Mr. Prime Minister pass to go to high school, so every check go to high school. Look, it's great to go to high school. It's not because I did not get to high school here in Dominica. It's great to go to high school. But for that, uh, it's not every child that was born to be a doctor, a lawyer, a pilot, a priest. Agreed. What we need to do is to look at the education system in Dominica, right? And go back to the drawing board and start at what we call the primary school level, even at the preschool level. At preschool, we need to start stop this thing of kids going to school and they take a nap and they look at ships. We need to give them ships to play with. We need to give them mangoes and limes or lateral fruits to learn what they eat, know what they smell, and know what they look like, and start this aggressive level of, um, of, at primary level. From there, you, 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 you have evaluation done. You can see the kids already progressing. What? You need to work on that. And bring back. You know, primary school should not be ending at the age of 19, 11, 12. That's nonsense. From there, those kids who do not do very well, and then that's why you have the problem. I have friends who are teachers at grammar school, at, at um, a good good school, and it's a mess. A lot of kids are not even a failing first grade. First grade is a review of what you did in, in, in before the exam, for the most part. People are failing there. So something not working, what you need to do is really go and um, look at the system, create a, high, a primary school, maybe more like 16, because there are people who learn later, they, they, they are slower learners, so they will probably learn you know, before the RNG JSP program time, they will learn around there, and then revisit the, the college we have, the state college. Mm -hmm. We need to bring more technical skills program at the college. Look at what happened after Maria, we had to import contractors. We still are importing contractors. So we need to look at this and figure out, in Dominica, what do we need? 
Where are you short of? And let's design an education program to fit that. Because the guy who wants to be a businessman will not be able to be a businessman until he realizes he's not able to. But he can be a businessman a different way. By learning a trade, being a carpenter, and have a successful business. And this is where you hire the guy to run the office for him. He's still a businessman, but in a different capacity. So this is the area where I think we need to look at. Unless we do that, I don't think this education system we have where everybody goes to high school and frustrating a lot of the teachers at the high school, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. That's one of the areas we can look at. The other aspect about it is offer more technical um, schools. Um, you know, we have elevators in Dominica, right? Sometimes I, I heard someone told me that an elevator was broken. They had to put the person from Guadalupe. Why don't we train our people in this? Why can't we do that here in Dominica? So the education system is not just about math and science. We, we need a strong STEM program, I agree. But I also believe we need to look at technical vocations. There are so many young ladies out there. I remember the Scots Government School in, in the 90s, early 90s. They had one of the best science lab in the country. The lab is just sitting there empty. The school is empty. Turn that Scotland government school into a technical school. You have fishermen in Scotland. You have two young people, two young gentlemen in Scotland, who are very good in fixing onboard engine. Give them the job. They're people from the island. Open this school, teach young people here how to fix onboard engines. That's an area where you can look at because it's a fish community. The guys go and see something up. They know how to do it. Things like that we need to come up with, and we need to. One of the ways I believe we can keep our young people off the street is to get them engaged in those technical programs and what we call internship. We need to look at internship. When we are doing at the college, uh, let's say somebody is going to school to be a plumber, or let's say somebody is going to school like at the state college, I think they have what they call a business degree. We need to look at placement. What is we church ask the friends and have them shadow these persons up there. That could be part of the curriculum. These are the areas where we can get young people out of trouble. I remember in the 90s on the film by the government too, they used to give them a tax credit, those stores where people from high school, you know what they used to do? They used to they give, the government used to give like we church on the spaces a tax break where they go and paper bags, you know, bagging the people groceries. You remember that? These are the things we have to go back. It worked. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to revisit these things. And unless we have members of parliament who understand that, we're not going to have anyone. This is the In the Spotlight radio show. Four minutes will be now past the 10 o'clock hour. We're coming back right after this. Keep it locked. In the Spotlight. I'm so right, nobody called. We edit every morning night from 8 to 10. You like the sport, you like the safety. Featuring people from all the world. So we can like them. Spotlight in their triumphs and tragedies. Dreams, hopes, aspirations. Untold stories. Touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Get it to know our farmers, our public servants, youth, and the ordinary Dominica. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight, we'll also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight featuring people from all walks of Dominican life spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies. Dreams, hopes, and aspirations, untold stories, touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Getting to know our farmers, public servants, youth, the ordinary Dominican. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight. Will also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. Yeah.
minutes past the 10 o'clock hour. This is the In The Spotlight radio show and tonight we're featuring Jeff Bellox. Apologies about that. <laughs> Our good old friend there from the great old house. Good evening to you, Steve. Just calling to remind me that he has dinner for us. So, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So, we can take some calls. We've not done calls in a while, but we can take some calls for um, Jeff Bella tonight on the In the Spotlight radio show. Remember, the numbers are... Do I remember the numbers? 449-3095, 449-3096, and 449-3097. If you want to call from overseas, I think it's 305-432-9624. If you would like to call in... 9642. 9642? 96... Well, what's written there is 9624. Oh, yeah. All right, so we're standing by to take uh, your calls if you'd like to contribute to the program. We know that we're starting in a half an hour late now, a half an hour later now. I hope that um, has in no way affected those of you who join us for the program at all. All right, so we are live in studios, Q95, and or in the Spotlight radio show page. And we would welcome your calls if you'd like to contribute uh, to the program. So, so Jeff, as we you know we stand by and we we await um, some of the we await some callers if they decide to uh, participate with us tonight. In terms of what you currently do and and your business, um, what level of business is it that you have um, in, in 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 the U.S. And um, how, how can Dominica benefit from that business and where do you take it from here? Well, what we do is, um, it's a lot of science involved. Science involved. Um, yes. But we have already made a step here in Dominica by starting the hatchery, where we bring eggs, incubate them, and hatch them and into Dominica. The next goal is to actually look at manufacturing feed in Dominica. Um, that's the next one. Okay. And a lot of people in Dominica, when they hear about feed, they think of corn and so mm -hmm. we have we have products in Dominica. And I know some of these are proprietary, may not be able to say it all. But we have some ingredients in Dominica. I've done some research here and realized we can grow actually not just corn for animals, but actually corn for human consumption and for animals. So the farmers, and this would be a great program where the farmers know if they have you know 5,000 um, plants of corn, they have a place for it to come right away. Um, there's another ingredient in Dominica, we have a lot of it we can use for corn, and we can use as a replacement for, um, for wheat, that's in animal feed. And um, you know, we got the pet store, we got all that. So manufacturing animal feed in Dominica is feasible. You got it subsidy, because in the beginning it's gonna be difficult 
to put all these things in place and you have to do a lot of trials and all of that. So I think this is one of the areas that we can do into agriculture, the next step. Because for the whole thing to work, I, I'm hearing a, a bag of feeding don't make a 60, 60 to 65 years old. That's mm -hmm. crazy. The farmer really not making any more than that. So I think when you talk about a $250 million, this is all of the projects I can need to look into to integrate the system. So I think this is one of the areas that our company can help with um, in, in training farmers as to, you know, how do you do um, good um, farming practices. Uh, recently there was this big talk on Q and DBS and all your regulation about food safety and they are the same. But are we really serious about food safety in Dominica? How many restaurants or hotels in Dominica has a food safety team leader? How? I don't think there's any such thing. A food safety team leader? That's important in the food industry. Because for you to be able to get a certificate, and, and you must have a, a food safety team leader. Because that person's job is to make sure that proper hygiene is being worn around people preparing food, and you also have to make sure that you know temperatures are right um you know people follow the instructions and you know make sure that nobody gets sick these things are critical and i don't even know if any sort even grocery stores like you're selling hot food cold food at the deli you need a food safety leader to make sure that things are checked to make sure that the food even on, on the shelf that it, it's proper and all of that so so these are the things that are important um you know our company can help with um, you know, help people, um, you know, get different certification through this program. And, and I'm looking at actually having a talk with the um, Bureau of Standards in Dominica to see how they can do that. But before I forget, um, for them, one of the things I want to go back to education, I have such mm -hmm. a passion for young people. I want to say, I want to join your program, your, your contribution that you're having. Just thinking about it is that I would really like to make a thousand dollar donation to, um, a, to your program for, what? for a child who just recently passed the corn insurance. Anybody in this concert community uh, 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 you know, could apply, and that I, I really want to make a thousand C dollars available for them. I believe in education. I believe that our people um, need to get good education and don't fall short. Mm -hmm. And I am making this from my heart because if someone who is not done making can do that, who am I? Yes. And I always, one of the things I was praying as God for, and one day help me be successful so I can bring back with my community. And I've done a lot of stuff there, I've started the library, so we primary, um, help the churches a lot. And there are the schools, I started a toothbrush program actually, at one mission and so and every year I give them the toothbrushes. But I want to go one step further, and, and I want to start with Scott said, and then we will probably um, see how far we can go in the other two communities. But I'm making it tonight available. That. So this one is that you're giving is for somebody in, in Scott's head. But they need to apply for your program. They need program. to apply through that. No problem. And uh, <laughs> they can get that one thousand dollars scholarship. I would be very, education. very happy um, to have someone from your community um, contribute, um, to, uh, apply. <laughs> yes, thank you for that so much. <laughs> You know, that is really, really appreciated. And even when we when we did that, you know, I remember having the conversation with her. I'm saying, um, would you be okay if, if you know, um, I ask other persons to support and so on? She said, no problem whatsoever. It just means that somebody will get my scholarship and then others will get, you know, from yep. the others. So um, thank you so much for that. You know, this is really, really appreciated. And I hope that folks who are listening from the Scottset area that you can, um, it's very simple. You, you send an email to inthespotlight.da at gmail.com and tell us why you would want to recommend a particular student who just sat the national assessment um, exams as to why that student should receive now um, this $1,000 scholarship as well um, from Mr. Bell, which I greatly, greatly appreciate. I mean, this really says a lot. Um, you put your money where your mouth is. Uh, you can see <laughs> in a case. I didn't see that coming, by the way. I didn't see well, that coming. <laughs> I love my people. I, yes. I, really, I really believe in you um, can do change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I know growing up how difficult it was as a single mom. Yes. And I know there's, you know, things are very hard now. It's different. Things are difficult. Okay, so um, we have someone who is calling in. And don't forget, you can call in and, and, and participate with us. 
Um, the numbers are 449 3095, 3096, 3097. Hello, good evening. Thank you for calling. Can you give me the that he shared with us on the program so far on the In the Spotlight uh, radio show. I felt that um, Mr. Bellot being here in Dominica at this time, as I said, he communicated with me on a completely different matter and you know, I, I invited him to be here because his story, stories like his, remember for those of you who may have tuned in late to the program, he sat common entrance and he didn't pass the exams, but he was at the top of the supplementary list, tried to get into secondary school, and nobody would accept him, at least for a couple of schools. And persons who were even lower on the supplementary list seemed to have found their way through to, um, through to secondary school, while he didn't. And, you know, of course, um, he would, he, he, he would Come to the conclusion because his mom was poor and you know nobody knew who he was and that was before he was put and put um a bell on. let's take this call good evening good evening to Diana. um i'm calling all the way from atlanta um just my buddy i'm listening to you and um first of all let me compliment you on your achievement You've done very well as a son of the soil, and um, that is what I guess has what might be the land of opportunity in the United States for us to have some because that we can come back home and come here. So I really, really want to compliment you, uh, congratulate you. Great discussion, great discussion. I'm enjoying it. Um, there's some things that I'm hearing that I didn't know before, so I'm going to add that to my list. And, and uh, so Diana is doing a pretty great, good job as well, drawing out some of that information from you. So, great discussion. And as I said, I'm listening in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, thank you. Thank you. All right, so somebody have you um, somewhat uh, covered here. Uh, so, so Jeff, you know, as we, we, we continue to wait to see if, um, you know, a couple of um, persons may call in and, and contribute, 
um, we would deeply appreciate it. Um, remember, the overseas line is 305 432 9624. Again, you know, just remind us of the lessons that came from the struggles that you experienced as a child in terms of your mother um, not, you know, being able to, to, you know, not being of riches. Um, the situation as it pertains to getting to know your father um, at, at the age of 18, um, the confusion with your names and all that. <laughs> what are the lessons from, from those experiences and, and, you know, growing up as a boy? What are the lessons that you learned? I think um, the lesson I really learned is that no matter what you go through, if you're doing something for the right reason, you're going to be just fine. Um, I didn't have this things about bullying. I was really bullied at school. I was called chocolate nail. I, I didn't know what it was. I was one of the like lightest skinned person in school. I was called chocolate nail. Um, the kids, I mean, I have so much burst head from them still. But those burst heads remind me of You mean shock. children literally yeah. threw stones at you and... Um, I still have a few of them. And then um, I remember that I used to run to my mother's house to get hot water and, and sugar. Because if I bring recess, some of the kids would take it from me. Mm -hmm. And I used to run to my mom's house and I would make hot water and sugar. And people didn't know. I mean, I'd always, this is why I really appreciate my mom. Mm -hmm. Because we really struggled. And my, um, I mean, I would call her myself with my daughter. And, and, and you know, my daughter was, you know, did well. And uh, he works in the US for me now, actually. <laughs> He works for you. Yeah. Um, in the US. Yes. Yeah. He's um, works with us and um, he, you know, he like numbers and his job fits him well and he does scheduling and it's interesting that I taught him how to do formulations and he able to put the formulations for the um, you know the different product we put together and stuff like that. And um, what's interesting is just opportunities, you know, like coming from Dominica, work and the job he had, you know, directly for the Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. This guy used to see, like, he was very part of the CBI program, like, when people apply for CBI, back like, then he had all the information for him. He had everything was transparent, and you know, that's, it's, you know, he left down like, uh, because he like what was going on, and went to the States, and he worked at home people in it, and then, you know, he wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. and, and I said to him, you know, we have an opportunity for you. And he came in, and um, he's been there, he started something in November, December, and he did a great job with 40 dollars. And, my mom is so happy to know that these two sons uh, work together and stuff. But I always remind he's the bigger brother, but I'm the boss. So. <laughs> so your mom is still alive? My mom is still alive. And, How um, is she? My mom is doing well. Um, she was ill recently, but she's doing much better. And um, you know, she's a very committed person, very humble person. When I told her I was going to go on the show, she said, okay, don't boast, okay? <laughs> 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 she said, you know, just speak the truth. And um, you don't have to make it, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about what you can do for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, and, and is, you did mention earlier on when your, your, children, your children's mother, did you ever get married, by the way? <laughs> uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, you know, there's what they call common law marriage. Right. Legal marriage. Right, right, right. <laughs> so. Did you, did you, um, did you, Keep your word in terms of caring for your mother and ensuring that your mom is okay. Of course. So, so my kid's mom, one of the things she agreed to was that, and um, we 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 worked this up very well. And I don't think my mom can complain about her as far as that goes by. And we, we, we kept that and did that. And the other thing was, I'm not gonna have kids until I, you know, I, I build a house in Bombay because at the time I'm like, hey, I work on the cruise ship. My dream on the cruise ship was to build a house. And honestly, come back to Dominica to run for public office. Mm -hmm. That was my plan. But, you know, I moved to the U.S., that changed. Plans changed. <laughs> Somebody's saying to you here, um, tell him to go ahead motivating the youth and leave politics. <laughs> tell him that he should stay here so the young people will know there is hope. Oh, thank you. And, and there is hope. There is hope. This great story of this guy selling the cannon and giving me some seeds to plant. And you know, like he showed me a picture of this, which is just last week, and he showed me, you know, the tomatoes and stuff is coming up. And we actually gonna meet on Friday. Mm -hmm. 
And we don't want to meet people to go to this place. And I have some extra seats I'm not going to give him. I'll show him what we call Square Garden. And I hope this guy, I really hope he can. And for the, the world is so small. I remember um, I was traveling recently, and um, this guy heard me spoke. And he said to me, I didn't just build up. I said, yes, I am. What did I do? <laughs> um, he said to me, do you remember the long time ago, you know, I was at We Church, and um, I was trying to cash out. And I think it's you. When you look at me, I was trying to put some stuff back. I didn't enough money, and you gave oh. me $10. I said I don't remember. To finish, to, to pay up for his items. Yeah, and, and, and shortly after that too, there's this lady, um, the world is so small, um, I saw she bought some fruits, right? So she's getting, she didn't have enough money to pay for it. So I end up, I was say, excuse me, ma'am, you know, like, it's okay, keep it. And I told her, I should just give her a form. Not knowing. Not, she asked me your friend, I told her. She said, do you still Nicholas? I say, yeah, that's my girl. It's like, I'm still Nicholas and work as statistics. And, I'm like, well, and this is the lady I've been giving my, my brother, like, fruits and vegetables from her garden. And that's, I'm saying these stories to make people realize whatever you do to anybody to help them, it goes a long way. Yeah. And never think of what little you do for somebody is nothing. Mm -hmm. It is something. And these people, they're going to remember this. Yes. It's how you make them feel. Yep. You, 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 somebody was, you know, probably troubled about how am I going to finish pay for what yes. this is. And then they, somebody comes and says, here, yeah, I'll help you. You mm -hmm. make that person feel good. Yep. There was some level of relief because who knows mm -hmm. what that was for. Could be for kids. It could be for, oh, yes. you know, you know. I, you know. And I see this happen all the time at the yes. grocery store here in Dominica where the kids want the candy and of course the mother put the candy back and we child pay for it. But it, this this something today so we have to be careful too. Because I wanna want um, especially you know vulnerable women, single mom, and this is the respect I have for women. Because there's some guys who do these things and you know they do this for transaction. Mm -hmm. And any guy who do this, shame on them. Shame on them. If this could be your sister, this could be your mom. And you have to have a level of respect. And one of the things I'm so fond of for my mom, my mom always cautioned me. Respect for women. Mm -hmm. And I try my best to do that because I knew what she went through as a single mom. And we have, you know, young people who don't think about these things. And I also want to talk to young ladies too. They need to respect themselves. You know, we, we, we get into a um, society of where we can wear what we want anywhere we want and think about it. And when people look at us, we're like, oh, what are you looking like? Wow. <laughs> if you advertise it, what you think? <laughs> if you want to be a billboard, people are going to read the billboard, right? <laughs> so, so, so this is the level of respect, like, I think we need to go to um, our young people. You know, they need to respect themselves. Jeff, it is 1029. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to wrap things up now on the In The Spotlight radio show. Good, great, great content. Um, from Jeff Belt here tonight on so many levels. Jeff, I really want to thank you for accepting my invitation to be on the program um, tonight. And I really do appreciate that extra mile, that hand that you stretched out, um, not to take, but to give and to share with your community. And I really do hope that um, we have some applications from the Scottsdale area that we can give that scholarship. I'm going to give you the opportunity for some final comments and we wrap it up. Well, let me first of all thank you um, for the opportunity. I remember when I called, we spoke with this question about television. <laughs> yes, and then totally we different. Out, and then I'm like, oh, some people are asking to come to this program. I'm like, I'll just do it. Yes. <laughs> but I'm glad I did. And I really hope tonight that um, somebody who is feeling hopeless can get some hope. And I want to really emphasize to you and say to them, we can do better. Let's think of what can we do for ourselves. Let's talk about people. Let's, what can we do? What do we have that we can use to make us better? And if we can do that. And parents, don't give up on your children. It could be difficult. Don't give up on your children. My mom did not give up on me. My daddy didn't give up on me. We had a great relationship. Unfortunately, one great relationship passed away. So let's don't give up on each other. Let's work together to what we can do to help ourselves, our family, and our country benefit from it. Jeff Bellots.
as we wrap up the In the Spotlight radio show. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kalalu House, for our dinner. So, Jeff, there's some dinner for you. Um, that I Great. Did. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Steve. That was a little interruption in our program earlier on, but hey, we don't mind. It's food, right? We'll go for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hey guys, we'll be back here next week Monday for another program. Thank you to everyone for your usual support of the program. Until next week Monday, God willing. Good night, everyone.